Um, our next speaker is Scott Bosque. Now, Scott's the Chief Executive of the Sustainable Melbourne Fund. Scott was appointed uh, as the CEO uh, in July 2010, reporting to a board of trustees. He is charged with leading his team to deliver positive environmental outcomes in a commercial and innovative manner. Currently, Scott and his team are delivering a new environmental upgrade financing mechanism for the City of Melbourne and administering, administering their 1,200 buildings program aimed at generating $2 billion in retrofit activity within the municipality. Tripping over all of these big words this morning. Scott has previously worked as a senior executive consultant providing strategic and commercial advisory services to a range of clients. Most recently, Scott was Australian County Director, Country Director of the Clinton Climate Initiative and worked with city, state and Commonwealth governments to accelerate activity and reducing emissions from Australia's largest cities. Scott is well regarding, regarded as a leader in the space on assisting small to medium-sized enterprises to capture the value of energy efficiency. So if you can please welcome Scott to the lectern. Thank you, Darren. Um, do these actually work? Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much for having me here today. I'd like to echo the sentiments made by Nicole previously that I um, am very happy to be here in South Australia and watch EUAs go through a, a consultative process as we're embarking upon today. Having been involved in EUAs for the last five years, um, it's been a journey that has been somewhat fraught with innovation and the challenges that that brings. And I think the opportunities that Adelaide and we, you'll hear today uh, there's a lot of lessons being learned and we're hopefully able to share that uh, th through today's session and into the future. So I'm going to really go through a, a relatively quick uh, presentation giving you kind of the context of, you know, why do we want to do environmental upgrade finance? What is it? Um, in, in the simplest possible terms, what are some of the benefits? What are the implications for local government and state government? How can you best administer these programs going on beyond setup and giving uh, certainty to the investment property uh, communities as well? Uh, and look at some of the, the issues and uh, opportunities where we are with, within Victoria in particular and uh, the current status and some of the key lessons that we have learnt as the administrator of that program in Melbourne. So a little bit about who the Sustainable Melbourne Fund is first. Uh, we are a wholly owned independent unit trust of the City of Melbourne. We were set up in 2002 and we've been investing in sustainability projects for uh, over 10 years now. Our first investments uh, were made into water efficiency uh, in 2002 and we were actually set up around the same time as the UK Carbon Trust and the Toronto Atmospheric Fund. So we've got over a decade of experience of investing into this space and uh, some of my trustees have got the war wounds to, to show for it and we were investing into the space before climate change was a real heavy uh, uh, debate. We've got two distinct uh, programs. First of all is our investment fund. We can make loans up to half a million dollars within the state of Victoria. So sorry, I can't make loans here in South Australia. And obviously we've been appointed as the uh, third party administrator on behalf of the City of Melbourne for their environmental upgrade finance program over there, which I'm here to talk to you about today. So why do we really want to look at uh, why was environmental finance, uh, environmental upgrade agreements actually uh, invested in and developed uh, to, to, uh, as, a, as a solution to some of the, the ails that face energy efficiency per se. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with these uh, McKinsey curves or the MAC curves, the marginal abatement curves of the opportunities for uh, uh, emissions reduction. This is a McKinsey curve for the Australian uh, sector and what you most uh, is, is most relevant to all of us here today is the things that we're actually talking about are on the negative cost side of the curve, they're below the line, so negative cost means profitable. But what we're actually seeing in this space is that these projects, despite being profitable, aren't actually necessarily being taken up at the rates that we'd like to see them taken up at, and often the, the low-hanging fruit is actually being left to rot on the floor. 
There's a range of barriers that actually exist uh, in, in unlocking that. Uh, you know, if something's profitable, surely somebody would come in and take the opportunity and make some money out of it. But as most of us would know, there are some traditional barriers that really exist to energy efficiency, to which environmental upgrade finance was uh, built to address. The City of Melbourne, when we embarked on this journey five years ago, um, began actually doing some market uh, analysis and uh, market research about what these barriers are. We all thought we knew what they were. It turns out we thought we knew what they were and we actually did not what they were. Uh, but it was lack of available capital was one of the primary uh, barriers to investing in energy efficiency. Um, that differs between the size and scale of different building owners, with small businesses and smaller family-owned buildings having an absolute lack of availability of capital, whereas bigger businesses had internal competition for a limit, limited amounts of capital for energy efficiency projects, where investment dollars tend to go towards revenue generation rather than cost reduction. Uh, the split incentive, you know, it's the why should a building owner spend capital when under a net lease the tenant gets the benefit through re reduced uh, utility uh, bills. And there's also a perception that this investment, the likelihood of the returns is highly risky. And that's probably because they show up generally as a, a savings as opposed to an annual return on investment or an annuity. Uh, and there's also a lack of awareness within organisations about how to actually capture the value of energy efficiency. The McKinsey curve showed that the opportunities there, these barriers actually present themselves as a reason as to why those opportunities aren't being taken. So within the City of Melbourne, and we, we just work within uh, the City of Melbourne's 1200 Buildings Program, they embarked on a strategy of zero net emissions by 2020 in the year 2000. In 2008, they revised that policy uh, decision and as part of that process, they identified that 53% of the council's emissions profile is actually associated with the commercial built environment within the City of Melbourne. So to that, they've, they developed the 1200 Buildings Program. The 1200 Buildings Program aims at retrofitting a total of 1200 buildings. It's actually two thirds of the built uh, uh, buildings within the City of Melbourne, which is actually 1,176 buildings, but rounded up 1,200 buildings sounded a little bit better. It's targeting to improve the performance of building stock from basically an average of two stars up to four and a half stars neighbours ratings, which equates to that 38% uh, greenhouse gas reduction or 383 kilotons. Now, the City of Melbourne has obviously got a climate change mandate to engage in environmental upgrade finance, but at its heart, this is really an economic opportunity for the municipality. With uh, the City of Melbourne and the State Government of Victoria actually undertook uh, analysis of the 1200 Buildings Program, and that if the full potential of this pro program was met, the economic opportunity for the state of Victoria is an increase in about $2 billion worth of activity, generating about 8,000 new jobs. Some industries face growth rates of about 300% to uh, address that market. So this at its heart and daily, I talk about the economics of this, and then if you care about the environment, you get that as an outcome of undertaking this kind of activity. Particularly, the City of Melbourne looked at what their built environment was. And uh, the, the, the statistic that I put up here, and this is similar to the analysis that was undertaken here in Adelaide and Fringe by Arup, uh, was actually undertaken by Arup back there for the City of Melbourne, identified that 10% of owners owned 42% of net level area, so a very big chunk of the property stock, and they own all the newer, bigger uh, buildings. Whereas the red circle there you see is the sum of those two parts means that 80% of owners own 47% of net letable area. So there's a lot of smaller buildings out there that can really um, benefit from environmental upgrade finance um, and, and the, the opportunities are sitting right there within their buildings. Both of them have the similar kind of barriers that I've discussed and uh, they, the environmental upgrade finance is a solution for everybody within the City of Melbourne at the moment. <coughs> So, what are the headlines? First of all, it is access to capital. Uh, you're going to hear later today from the NAB and uh, Low Carbon Australia who have currently created a fund in the market. Um, that fund uh, is able to finance projects between $250,000 up to $10 million and it's 100% finance available for these projects up to 10 years in term. 
So the tenors, terms and tenors of this finance, as enabled by the mechanism, is actually very attractive and very symbiotic with the nature of energy efficiency projects. It's cheaper than what otherwise available, and uh, some would argue that 10-year money in the uh, commercial property market isn't actually available, so any money available is good money available. Um, the longer tenor and fixed interest uh, are actually uh, are more uh, aligned to, to the nature of energy efficiency, which I think uh, you'll hear a bit more about today later. Uh, the, the detail is this is a real opportunity because it overcomes the split incentive to unlock completely new cash flows for building owners. Um, the opportunity for tenants is that it's 100% off balance sheet finance available for improvements within their tenancies, and I think we're going to hear about some of those projects today as well. Um, environmental upgrade finance was uh, developed by uh, the City of Melbourne through consultation with the NAB and uh, a range of lawyers and stakeholders in Melbourne uh, and uh, as subsequently popped up in uh, New South Wales which we'll hear about today and hopefully in South Australia in the not too distant future. Um, our role is we uh, essentially act as the administrator and we'll go into a little bit of detail around that. So what is environmental upgrade finance? In 2010, a bill was introduced into the Victorian Parliament. It was an amendment to the City of Melbourne Act to essentially enable the City of Melbourne to levy what's called an environmental upgrade charge. It's similar to a council rate or special rate or levy, and uh, the purposes of which is to, 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 to finance the improvement of the built environment uh, through the retrofit activity. Similarly, and this, this was a result of three years of engagement from the City of Melbourne working with the state government to try and uh, get this over the line. Similarly, in July 2011, uh, sorry, in June, January 2011, there must be something about this stand, I can't get my words out. <coughs> uh, legislation was introduced in uh, New South Wales, which uh, Dominique and Matt can talk about as well, to enable this finance mechanism to be rolled out across all council areas within New South Wales. So, the best way I can describe how it is, how this finance mechanism works, is through pictures. They tell a thousand words. Essentially, environmental upgrade finance is a tri tripartite agreement between three parties a building owner, a municipal council, and a financier. The way the mechanism works is a project is qualified, and I'll make my job sound very si simple in the, the City of Melbourne program. Projects come to us, we give them the tick or the cross and then it goes through into the financing. The financial institutions, actually, they provide all of the money for these programs, so it doesn't require councils to actually put any money into these kind of upgrades. This is 100% financed by the private sector. The finance institutions make money available to those projects. At the same time, the City of Melbourne places the environmental upgrade charge on the property, which is essentially equal to the repayments associated with that funds advance. The money is collected by the, the, the City of Melbourne or a local government and then distributed back out to the financial institution through the council rates mechanism. A lot of people say, why do we want to go through all of this? From a lender's perspective, this is a very rich form of collateral. It makes uh, investing in energy efficiency an attractive proposition. Without environmental upgrade finance, investing in energy efficiency is somewhat of a challenge from a lender's perspective. There's not too much residual value in a used light bulb. I can't go and take that out and sell it on the market and get all my money back. So lenders traditionally wanted to get other forms of collateral, like a mortgage or something like that. From a building owner's point of view, it's access to capital, 100% finance, and it overcomes the split incentive. The key to EUAs is uh, actually being able to work with tenants and overcome some of those challenges to unlock the internal subsidies that are lying in every building in Australia. That's the low-hanging fruit of uh, tenancy lighting upgrades and energy efficiency opportunities. What are the key features? Well, first of all, the nature of the environmental upgrade charge is super senior. This is the rich form of collateral that lenders like. So when, if, if things go wrong, the banks or the lenders to these programs are in a senior position, which makes it attractive to lend to. The charge is attached to the property, so if a property is sold that has an environmental upgrade charge to the building, the charge can stay with the building. Um, and that goes into some of the design principles that I'll touch on in a second. The tenant pass-through. Environmental upgrade charges are a statutory charge, so under most net leases, uh, statutory charges are included in the outgoings component 
of a lease. There's slight nuanced differences between the legislation in Victoria and New, York, uh, and, uh, New South Wales, which I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and local government's rights remain unfettered. So the government's uh, role in this is purely to act as they, they currently do, which is declare, levy and collect rates and distribute payments and bills out. That's ultimately the heart of what the role of local government is and they retain those rights. <clears throat> and the program is voluntary. This is individual building owners saying, put a council rate on my building because I see the benefit in all of this. This is not a mandatory approach. Uh, this is an incentive opportunity where people can unlock the business opportunities associated with EUAs. These key features lead to some of the design principles. First and foremost, we take an approach where projects must be permanently affixed to the building. The rationale behind that is if a charge stays with the building, the cost stays with the building, the benefit must also stay with the building. So if we financed IT upgrades and a tenant move out and took all the, the uh, equipment with it, then the, the uh, benefit disappears while the cost remains. Uh, it must deliver greenhouse and water savings. They're the key focuses in Victoria, and I think it's similar in New South Wales. Um, and that recognise that technology has a long flat tail of technology and as well as innovation. Um, and first, first of all, first and foremost, the real opportunity is to help building owners and tenants engage with each other to unlock completely new cash flows available. This might be a little bit small, but I will touch on a various number of stakeholders involved in this around the key benefits. From the building owner, I think the, the, the headline uh, opportunity here is access to those new cash flows to help service these kind of debts. Um, it improves asset value as IPD research is, is, is showing. And uh, from a tenant's point of view, uh, this is a real opportunity to access off balance sheet finance for tenancy improvements, as well as a reallocation of currently wasted money within tenancies. I don't know how many of you in this room lease an office space, but at current you waste about 30% of your money that you spend on an energy utility just to burn it and throw it away. Environmental upgrade agreements and environmental upgrade charges present an opportunity to reallocate that to productive use and deliver you a better building and tenancy in which you occupy. Industry, well this is a real opportunity for you to finance your projects that you want to get off the ground um, in the, the built environment. We see some real opportunities with building owners uh, working with uh, product suppliers to say here's our product and here's a nice way to pay for it. From the financial institutions lending to the program, this is a very very attractive form of collateral and uh, it enables money to flow to these projects uh, where they become available. And existing mortgagees are a critical stakeholder within this um, uh, space and we argue that it actually enhances building value, therefore enhances the existing mortgagee position in relation to environmental upgrade agreements. Benefits of municipality, Nicole touched on a few of these. The identity in uh, Adelaide over here, about 660 million has been identified as the opportunity. I would uh, guess that that's going to be a lot more of opportunity because in Victoria and New South Wales, environmental upgrade agreements don't only just apply to commercial office. Industrial, retail and uh, commercial properties are some of the big opportunities that we really see coming along. For a municipality, it strengthens community. It reallocates wasted money on uh, utility bills and allocates it to uh, investment within your municipality to these retrofit activities. <coughs> I'm getting the, uh, the wink to hurry along here. And, uh, and there's no budgetary impact from a council's point of view. This is 100% private money going to private projects as facilitated and enabled by environmental upgrade agreements. It's voluntary and there's no credit risk associated to the municipality. Unlocks sustainability benefits, increases investment into local communities and meets some of the emissions and, and uh, efficiency targets of councils. How do you administer these? There's a couple of challenges associated with EUAs. First of all, the setup costs can be quite high, um, but I think South Australia has uh, you know, fast follower benefits to that. There's two case examples ahead to which we're all here to share and learn about so you can up, uh, um, overcome those. As you move on to ongoing program uh, administration and operation, um, some of these become a, quite a challenge for individual councils to administer because you need significant to deal flow to administer and justify some of the costs in administering these programs. 
which is where I think some of the opportunities lie within a third party administration model. The two models for administering these programs are a third party administration model, like what the SMF does for the City of Melbourne, or indeed internal programmatic teams uh, looking after individual programs within um, uh, councils. In both cases, councils still need to declare, levy and collect these charges, which is actually core business for what a council currently does. Our role, I'll skip through this, we've touched on it a bit, is we work as the third party administrator. We take and assess projects on behalf of the council and then work with the parties to execute the agreements and monitor the ongoing performance of the program. It's a fee for service a model and the City of Melbourne recently undertook a review of our contract and thankfully reapplied our contract uh, for these service provision because they found it was the least cost delivery mechanism for them. Sustainable Melbourne Fund is currently working on uh, in, in examining a national uh, pro program for consistency across the country so that uh, it makes investment easier from a lender's perspective as, all, as well as from a building owner's perspective and tenant's uh, perspective. In Victoria, EUAs are only available in the City of Melbourne at this stage. We hope that in the future that would quickly copy what has happened in New South Wales and be rolled out across all municipalities within um, Victoria. Three, uh, four deals have been signed to date within the municipality um, and uh, we're, we're working on a pipeline with NAB, Low Carbon Australia and other suppliers in the marketplace that we hope uh, will come to fruition in the near future. Some of the key lessons. At the end of the day, EUAs are simple. It's not much different from Visa. Visa are a collection agent on behalf of lenders. Visa don't give you money, they facilitate money from a lender. But they provide the services that enable the money to flow from uh, consumer to lender. So this is ultimately a si simple um, opportunity. Tenant engagement is paramount. The low hanging fruit, the only real subsidy available to uh, the commercial built environment at the moment exists within tenancy and those are the tenancy lighting upgrades uh, that we all know that are there. The e EUAs are the best um, incentive available in the market through unlocking new cash flows for building owners and the off balance sheet finance for the tenants. It re does require a strong tenant landlord relationship and that collaborative approach that I'm seeing is going quite well here in South Australia. Whilst this is a uh, finance product at its core, it does require a, a de degree of market education. So we do need to work collaboratively to, to lift the understanding of these. Things that are new are often considered a high risk, and in actual fact, this is a very low risk, no different from any other kind of financing uh, approach uh, that happens at, at, in, in the market today, except that it is a lot lower risk and more attractive. And it does require early engagement by, by some stakeholders. There's a bunch of resources out there. If you haven't read it, I would recommend reading the Fifth Estate EUI, EUA um, handbook and find out some more details following the presentations today. So thank you.